Right, thank you so much. Um, good morning. Um, so my name is David Liu. I'm a Python technical consultant engineer for Intel, and today I'll be talking about addressing multi-threading and multi-processing in transparent and Pythonic methods. So just kind of a general overview of this talk, um, one of the things I'm going to do is you know, kind of state what the current uh, state of concurrency and parallelism is in the industry. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about nested parallelism and over subscription, what those problems are. <clears throat> We're going to talk a, a little bit about composable methods and thread control, and then you know how some of these packages work under the hood that address these these issues, what it means to have a Pythonic style, and kind of the future of Pythonic style for parallelism. So one of the things I, I kind of like to do is you know the Python language itself has had a lot of luck in attracting good talent and a lot of the um, uh, the best people for addressing uh, concurrency and multiprocessing. And so we can see that lesson here. Um, we're one of the few languages that encompass all of these frameworks. Um, and over the years, you can see the progression of the frameworks has kind of included um, just general threading, multiprocessing, uh, uh, task parallel type of uh, workflows. And you can see that the uh, the large amount of packages that are now in this space help fill out the Python ecosystem such that we do have a lot of options when we choose to go for parallelism. And we're one of the few languages to have that. And you know, from 2008 to 2017, uh, you can see that just you know, the large amount of packages that we have. And a few of those packages have actually been talked about at this conference. So, Again, like I said, the options in this space are very good compared to other ecosystems, and the majority of them do a very good job playing, uh, playing nicely with the global interpreter lock. Um, if you were expecting this talk to get rid of the global interpreter lock, this is probably not the talk for you. <laughs> but um, you know, we do a very good job by doing uh, distributed or vectorization techniques or by working nicely with the GIL. And that's one of the, the biggest benefits of the Python ecosystem and the, pi and the packages that are included in this ecosystem. For the more domain-specific areas, one can rely on um, high-end C libraries to do that type of work for you, to harness parallelism and threading. So SciPy and NumPy do a great job of this, right? So you know, when you make a NumPy call under the hood, it's calling a C library, which is doing the majority of the par data parallelism work that, that uh, is required to get the job done quickly. And with that being said, you know, one of the recent trends in the industry is an increasing amount of core count and thread counts, and that's becoming more commonplace um, in the server space and even in your um, uh, laptop space that you have. You, you're seeing an increasing amount of cores and threads that are becoming available. Uh, and because of that, nested parallelism and oversubscription are now quite possible in the kernels that you're doing. And so some of you may be asking, well, what exactly is that, right? Um, and we'll go into that in a little bit, but let's first talk a little bit about the gill, you know, because this this con this topic gets talked about a lot, right? The gill has been complained about by many people in this space, um, and many efforts have been made to remove the gill. Uh, you know, there's a few talks in the last few years at PyCon that have been trying to do it. Um, there's been a lot of efforts to remove it, and you know, there's very valiant efforts to remove it too. But as it stands, you know, what the GIL provides us is relatively important. And it's kind of hard to ignore some of those, right? You know, the read-write safety of Python objects, predictable behavior, right? The language really wasn't written to be thread safe. And you know, the, the guarantees that you get with types and everything come from the guarantee that the GIL provides you. Uh, and in addition to that, you know, the, when you're developing your own modules and extensions and, and other things, that type of expectation on the developer is a very hard expectation is to say, well, if I'm developing a framework, I now have to expect that, you know, I have to, you know, it's not gonna be single threaded. Other people may be accessing my objects. That's extremely hard to test. So, you know, passing that burden onto the de developers is also not that great of an idea. And again, that's why the Guild provides something to allow you to be able to um, easily work and create extensions for Python. Um, and again, because the GIL is, uh, it provides that safety, 
and we have so many good frameworks, it's kind of a non-issue today, right? You know, you can, there's, there's many uh, frameworks that have found a way to cleanly step around the gill. Um, and SciPy and NumPy are great examples of this, right? You basically send a command for, you know, NumPy dot dot or something similar. It gets dispatched to, you know, your, your BLOSS API. Um, and, you know, you can then use the uh, Intel, Intel's math kernel library or you're using OpenBLOSS depending on your implementation. That gets vectorized and parallelized inside the CPU and gets dispatched completely transparently to you, right? So NumPy and SciPy do an amazing job of this. Um, and that's kind of one of the examples of cleanly stepping around the gill by understanding what that data flow is. Um, and again, there's a lot of other frameworks that utilize this type of vectorization, right? You have Numba, NumExpression, Cython, all do this type of vectorization work for you while allowing you to stay within the Python layer. Um, Multiprocessing frameworks that, that now have now been included into the main library of Python as of Python 3, right? have uh, great ways of escaping via separate processes, not necessarily just um, you know, stepping uh, from the vectorization line, of, but you can also have separate threads within those, and that's where you know, some of the oversubscription problems can happen. Um, generally, exiting the gill in, with a C library is the most Pythonic-ish way of doing things, um, and this has been talked about by a lot of people in, in the numeric space, is that you know, if you understand the abstraction of your computational flow, you can write a library that can do this type of work, wrap it in Python, and that essentially is the most Pythonic way of operating. Um, and this comp composition of abstracted flows by splitting, you know, you can also do this by splitting off into multiple processes, uh, can also be a cleaner way of escaping the gill. Um, and you know, it's very rare to absolutely necessitate the language to be thread safe. I mean, there's very few instances that we would ever need to really do that. And I think that, uh, that issue of, uh, the advantages of Python going away would probably be the main detractor if we started doing that. So if we start breaking up the space now into three main areas, um, so you know, with this Venn diagram, if we look at application level parallelism, we look at single thread concurrency and data parallelism focus, we can split up the majority of the frameworks in this space um, and kind of categorize them and see what areas overlap. So, you know, you see the area that has been talked about a lot with, you know, Trio and um, Tornado or Celery or anything really that lies within concurrent futures. Um, yeah, that, that's another big thing is, you know, when Python, um, you know, came down to say concurrent futures are the API that we want to really support, um, that was a huge area because now thing, a lot of these frameworks are, are now designing towards it. Um, you can see where that area is more of an, uh, like the single threaded concurrency. And when most people think that they need parallelism, they most likely just need concurrency. Um, and then when you get to application level parallelism, uh, you're, you're seeing like multiprocessing or job lib or similar frameworks uh, being in that space. Um, Dask also encompasses part of that frame, framework. Uh, when you get to the data parallelism focus, you can see that the, the packages that we talked about in the numerical space, NumPy, SciPy, Numba, Cython, NumExpression, all sit in that area because they understand that the data parallel is the area that they want to focus in. And by you know, abstracting that call, you can then exit the gill, do that type of data parallelism type of work whilst, while being able to return all of that back into the Python layer. Um, and then when you get into areas where you needed both single thread concurrency and data parallelism, you know, you can get like MPI for Pi or some really weird types of uh, concurrency and data parallelism focus that, that will lie in that area. Um, and then the center area of obviously maybe it's a unicorn, maybe it's MPI for Pi, like, you know, obviously that's also a little harder to work with. So that, this hopefully will give you an understanding of what the different areas are encompassed. And what I wanna do with this though, is try to focus down and talk about two specific areas today. So if we're gonna take a look today at application level parallelism and data parallelism focus, this is where a lot of kind of the, uh, final frontier has been, has been sitting. And so if we expand that now into three areas, we have Python multiprocessing, Python multithreading, and then data parallelism focus. So now you can see where you know, some of these frameworks now lie and like Dask is clear in the middle of it. It's one of those actually interesting uh, type of frameworks. If we were in the US and Matthew Rockland was here, he'd be very happy <laughs> as he's one of the uh, main, main maintainers of Dask. Uh, 
But that being said, now, now that we understand what space I want to talk about today, uh, this area, that's kind of the intersection of them, is where nested parallelism and oversubscription can occur. When you start mixing these different libraries, multiprocessing with NumPy or uh, Numba with you know, other elements that have been composed on top of, or you start getting to multi-threading, this is the area that, that oversubscription and, and nested parallelism can occur. So you may ask, what does that actually look like? The answer to that is, is it, it can look like relatively benign code, right? So for many of you, this may look like a very, very simple type of thing that you would run into if you were just developing a NumPy or you were just trying to you know, scale just a little bit. Um, you know, so here we have uh, a, a NumPy call with random. We have multiprocessing uh, pools with a thread pool. And then we're going to do a pool.map on a NumPy call. Well, what exactly actually have you done here, right? The problem is, is you've now done a composable uh, type of nested parallelism without even knowing it. Um, and that's where it can get really, really scary because now you can have threads being spawned in a nested parallel process. And if you start putting this on a larger uh, compute system, it can go out of control. So you, know, you go from P threads and then uh, P Python threads, and then you go to the threads that are in NumPy, well, then what will happen is that nested capability will then create like nearly double or quadratic the amount of threads if you're not careful, depending on what's available on the system, right? And so you go from a relatively known set of threads that you're like, okay, you know, this one called the NumPy, I know what's going on, right? Well, now if I call that with multiprocessing on top of it, I've just kind of created a mess and tangle of, of threads because now one can spawn a bunch of other ones, but it's relatively uncapped because it doesn't have any rules being passed down. So, you know, what are the problems that you have with that is you essentially will get oversubscription, right? And so you'll have a lot more threads than are actually mapped to the CPU and they're also then mapped to other ones. So it's not, it doesn't have any rules controlling it. So with that many threads, you'll have direct over, uh, OS overhead for switching out threads, CPU cache becomes cold. You're gonna get a performance hit and you're gonna say, well, this worked actually faster on my laptop. How did that happen, right? Um, it, it's kind of an invisible impact if you're not used to it. Um, and other threads are kind of waiting for the, for the other ones to return and it's just like, it's, it's just trying to, you know, has way too many threads to the actual logical cores. Now, a lot of the popular frameworks that have this problem have solved it in a, in a relatively simple-ish way. It's not the cleanest way. And what they do is they lock the amount of threads to one for that specific process, which is an okay-ish solution, but it does, doesn't scale well. Um, you know, they'll set OMP num threads, they'll, pay, they'll set the block time to lower, uh, but it's not always you know, the cleanest way. And, you know, scikit-learn definitely has this. If you use grid search, you'll see it. Um, PyTorch, TensorFlow, they all exhibit this problem because the type of composable parallelism that they use to give you the type of uh, either the machine learning or other forms of work, they, this is one of the issues that they run into. Um, and, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about SMP when we get to it, but, you know, this is one of, SMP is one of the packages that addresses it. So, now let's talk about the composability modules that help address this space, right? Um, one of them is TBB for Pi, and you know, from our Intel distribution for Python, uh, TBB for Pi is included with our distribution, it's free, uh, and what it is is actually a Python C extension for managing the nested parallelism um, using a dynamic task scheduler. So. Uh, if you use our version of uh, scikit-learn in our Intel distribution for Python, we actually use uh, TBB under the hood for some of those. But when you start looking at what it's providing, this is you know, kind of the focus today, is what exactly is it providing is the dynamic task scheduler for, uh, for that. So if you have dynamically mapped tasks and you have ones that will occasionally end up a lot faster than, than the completed ones, it's able to you know, put those back into the thread pool and allow you to spawn new ones even if they're unbalanced. So it, does, it handles unbalanced work relatively well and it instantiates via monkey patching of the Python's pools enabling um, the TBB threading layer to be interchanged from, you know, with the MKL here. And so no code changes are required on your part because of that monkey patching capability. Uh, another one that we use in this space is uh, static multiprocessing or SMP. Um, and it's a pure Python package that manages nested parallelism through coarse grain static settings. And so what that means is it's trying to augment your 
um, parallelism by saying, I'm going to take the, uh, the rules that have been defined by your, uh, your, your parallelism and the types of environment variables and pass them down to the inherited processes to try to control uh, oversubscription via that method. So it handles ones that are a little more structured uh, in, that, in that way. It again instantiates via monkey patching um, and it uses affinity masks to and over OpenMP to statically define and allocate those resources to avoid those excessive threads. So now if we return back and we look at this example, you can see that you know, these two packages can address the, the, the issue that we have here. So with, you know, with the nested parallelism, how, how does that actually uh, work? So TBB tries to accomplish this by saying, okay, you have your application, you have your OpenMP uh, threading, and you, know, you have separate but uncoordinated areas of uh, OpenMP parallel regions. And so what happens is you know, it tries to map too many uh, software threads and it tries to compete uh, for all the logical processors and you know, it tries to map too many of them. Um, and what the t running under the TBB module essentially does is it says this is the pool that's defined and it can dynamically allocate or, uh, and, and uh, you know, release new ones to be able to operate within that pool. So it tries to keep them mapped to, uh, the, to the logical processors while, while keeping that um, uh, the, on hold of the uh, oversubscription. Because if one of these starts, starts uh, spawning like five or 10 of them while the other one starts spanning one, you can start seeing where the problem occurs. Whereas this, if it starts wanting to spawn, then it'll still be pulling from the same pool and still be mapped to an actual logical processor. Now SMP does it in a completely different way. It says with the same problem that we had before, it's saying we want to take the uh, thread pool implementation and propagate the uh, mask and settings towards each of the individual spawn processes to go down. And so you're essentially augmenting your MKLR BLOS threading to be able to uh, have the, uh, the augmented settings passed down to each of the threads that are created from those processes. Uh, and so one of the advantages here is you can actually mix the type of uh, threading. It can handle both uh, both types of uh, uh, th uh, OpenMP threading in this case, which is relatively powerful. Um, so one of the things I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you a little, uh, a small demo of what this will look like when when you start you uh, having oversubscription, and I'll be running this on one of our um, just you know relatively large 2U socket server to show you what that looks like, and then showing you how these these um, uh, these frameworks address that problem. So right here, uh, I'll show you kind of what, what type of setup this is. So this, this has, you know, with hyper-threading, it has about 88 uh, cores. So it's a but it's two U socket, um, and it's uh, one of the Xeons. So one of the things I'll do here is, this will take a bit of a, wa uh, a while, but um, let's see. Hope the SSH channel works today. So this will take a little bit of time. So what this code is actually running, and I'll and I'll show you here. It's a relatively benign piece of code, and again, you know, we have we have a for loop, we have a thread pool map that's from from multiprocessing, and we have a a, a NumPy call that's called inside of it. And um, you know, one of the things that that you can see from this is it's a relatively small amount of code that we might have written ourselves that could actually cause this problem. And so if I were to run this on my local laptop, it wouldn't be too bad. But if I'm running it on a system with that many cores and that many, um, uh, that many uh, uh, threads, it's gonna take a while. So um, here, this, this example uh, will we'll repeat three times and you know, it'll display the time that it took to actually get accomplish this. So the first one took 39 seconds. So now I have to burn off another 30, two, two times 39 seconds while I'm talking here <laughs> to let this complete. So again, you know, while we're while we're letting that run here, um, you know, we, we, essentially what that what what it's done is we have our uh, you know our our data which is created by NumPy random. Um, we have our thread pool created through the multiprocessing pool. We have a three, a loop of three, which is looping three times. You know, the time, it's relatively simple call here. 
uh, and then QR and that for the amount of data in that range. And so let's see if we've, okay, so it's, we've, we've hit the second one now, right? <laughs> so we just have to burn off another 39 seconds here, right? So again, this is because what we showed in that last, in that last uh, slide before that is you're essentially hitting over the description because it's saying, oh, I have all these threads that I can address and I have you know, the, the multi-processing then mapping to the threads. It's like, hey, look at all the threads that I can create. It's just gonna create as many as it can, right? And so that's where you, know, you can get in trouble is now you've written your application. It works great on your laptop. You scale it to, uh, you know, to your server on your production machine and oh, this is, why is it slower? Why is it so much slower? So one of the things that you can do now is you can actually run it like this. Right, and what TBB is going to do is it's gonna say, my, I'm gonna set my pull size. I think there's some defaults and you can actually look at what those are by uh, doing TBB and then you can ask dash dash help and it'll show you what the, what the default sizes are. And you can set that dynamic pull size. So if I start running this, I'm probably not gonna have enough time to actually finish my, my discussion here before it just decides to you know, clean itself up. But yeah, so there you go. <laughs> um, when we talk about combating oversubscription, quantifying what that problem can have and that nested parallelism can have is very evident now, right? So, you know, something such as, as simple as the, uh, the demo that I just showed you, you know, TBB could just handle that, you know, and that's relatively Pythonic. You can actually call it your, your script under TBB. You made no code changes. I made zero code changes to this thing and it actually did that, right? SMP handles it a slightly different way, right? And so now if we call it under SMP, and run it now, then um, again, it's taking those settings, that, that augmented style of parallelism, and now it's completing it relatively quickly. So here you can also see, you know, it, it accomplishes the handling of nested parallelism and over description in a completely different way, but it still addresses it and still is able to handle that in a relatively um, simple way by allowing you to run under SMP without making any code changes. Okay, so now that we've kind of seen this demo, um, you know, I think it's time to bring it back a little bit and talk about you know, the, the, the industry again, right? So in concurrency, in Python's ecosystem of concurrency and parallelism, much of the concurrency and async areas are very rich with packages, right? There's a lot of packages in that space. We've done a lot of work with concurrent futures and it helps to solve the need of the majority of the Python users. But now when we look at the areas of true parallelism and data parallelism, it's a strong area, but its, it's focus has been you know, relatively uh, small in comparison to the concurrency and async offerings. Uh, so you know, that's why you know, when, we, when we look at the packages in this space, there really hasn't been much uh, shown in the area, and we're trying to now make headway as kind of one of the final frontiers of uh, parallelism in Python. Um, so most of the ways of achieving parallelism in this area rely on vectorization frameworks or with multi-processing uh, or distributed uh, uh, methods. So I think that kind of pops the question of how do you do it in a semi-Pythonic way, right? So I'm gonna introduce this kind of silly idea of Pythonic-ish. I'm not saying it's true Pythonic because like, you know, that, that's a whole different discussion. Um, but let's just talk about Pythonic-ish. What makes it, you know, relatively Pythonic-ish? is relatively few code changes, right? So you, you might have you know, a small few bit of code changes. Maybe you have to modify its current behavior of, of one's framework to fit your needs, so, you know, or you know, to prevent a massive rewrite, so that's one of the things that would be considered. You know, is it in, directly in the Python standard library? Um, is it writable from the Python layer? Do I have to drop into a different lower level language like C to be able to, to, to utilize it? Is the interface easy to understand? And uh, does, does it keep you in the Python layer and then not drop to an in intermediate representation, right? So I think that then poses a question, how close can we get? So if we look under the lens of TBB4Py, you know, it meets quite a bit of these, but again, two of them aren't met, which is that it doesn't directly, it's not directly in the Python standard library and it's not writable from the Python layer. But on the other hand, you don't have very many code changes you're not modifying a lot of the current behavior of that framework to make it work for you. It's a relatively easy interface. You saw that I just, just 
called it while under the module of TBB, ran the script, made no code changes, so it's a relatively easy interface to understand. You can set those with some command arguments if you need it. And it keeps you in the Python layer and doesn't drop to an intermediate repre representation. Looking under the lens of uh, SMP, you know, it's relatively a uh, few code changes, and it doesn't modify any current behavior or framework. Now, one of the interesting parts is it is somewhat writable from the Python layer because it does have an API that you can use, um, but it, you can also use it without that, uh, and you can run it just like I did where I'm just running it under the SMP module and letting it just pass down the settings. Um, it's relatively easy to understand, and it keeps you in the Python layer. Um, I think the other thing to also add here is SMP is completely in Python, so you can look at it on our GitHub. It's, it's, it's a pure Python package. So, you know, from the standpoint of being able to integrate that into a solution or into other people's frameworks, it's relatively simple. You know, but it's still, again, not in the standard library, but it's maybe a little closer to it, but it's accomplishing in a different way. So, I think this then poses the question of, you know, these, these final four questions, which is how realistic is it to have a firm requirement for a pure Python implementation, right? So TBB is not a pure Python implementation, but SMP is. Um, and these, again, now we're talking in the light of addressing, you know, nested parallels and, and oversubscription. Um, the second question would be, you know, what is the best way to modify your Python code? Is it monkey patching? Is it new, you know, new, a different framework? Like, how do we want to address that space? when we want to modify our Python code to operate under those, um, uh, under that, that augmented uh, threading. And at what level should the parallelism be controlled, right? Should we be controlling it at the module call level? Should we be controlling it when we're um, calling it from our, our own source code? Where should we be doing that? And can an interface be agreed upon to operate on that parallelism, right? So, you know, concurrent features did that relatively well. Um, can we do the same? So let's answer the first two questions. And you know, now with, with the demos being shown for TBB 4 pi and SMP, how realistic is it to have a firm requirement for a pure Python implementation? I would say it's not required, but it's highly recommended. You know, we, we can see that with the, uh, the uptake of the packages that we've released, people are more trending towards the pure Python variants of it um, there's also limited things that you can do from the pure Python layer, but maybe that's something that vendors can work with, you know, the, uh, the actual Python uh, in the PSF and the, the core developers to try to find something out. And what's the best way to modify your Python code? Is it through monkey patching a new framework? It's seeming like monkey patching is the, the, the new normal from this space. We're seeing a lot of examples where uh, monkey patching is becoming, you know, the de facto standard when making packages that augment other packages' behavior. We see that in Scikit-Learn, and we see that in other places. So, uh, you know, that that seems to be the new normal and seems to be okay. I think you also have that question of at what level should this parallelism be controlled, right? Should should it be controlled at the Python layer, maybe? Um, so I think that question is is like, well, the Python layer, it's sort of it can be controlled from that area. Uh, the, the, the challenge that you'll start finding is that it needs directives for how additional layers can compose it, right? And that in itself, maybe, you know, some type of composing directive would be useful in that space. Uh, can an interface be agreed upon to operate on that parallelism, right? I think the jury's still out on that one because with every iteration that we make of attempting these packages, you know, we learn something new. We learn something that works and that doesn't work. And we're, it seems like the Python community is still in that space. And I urge you, if you're in this space, to continue pushing and seeing what, what makes sense. We do, we're still very, very young in this space to know what is Pythonic, what's the best way to operate on it, what's the, you know, the, the best way of operating and augmenting your threading behavior and keeping that to be able to scale when you actually deploy this to you know, your, your production cluster or something similar. But you know, with SMP, we do get a, a slightly more clear picture as to what it could look like. You know, so now that we look, uh, you know, I've talked about all of this, I think we you can see now that TBB for Pi and SMP attempt to address you know, the Pythonic-ish methods that I've set out and augment the way you do multi-threading, multi-processing, and to try to do it with a way that makes it such that you don't have to modify a lot of your code. And you know, I, I would still say it's best to leave the two forms of multi-processing and multi-threading at their same levels and to not really change too much of how we interact with them. 
at least from the Python and C levels, you know, try to keep them at, at their respective levels. Um, and most, most multi-threading is domain specific. So I've talked about like, you know, when you do, do something that's data parallel, typically you know the domain that you're operating in. And that's seeming to be the best choice. And you have a lot of options for staying in Python or you can drop down to C if you need it, right? So, you know, Num NumPy has decided that they want to be in C and these other frameworks allow you to stay within, um, within the Python layer and still not have to actually build with some type of C-based library, right? So Numba, Num Expression, Cython um, do a great example of this. And, you know, one of the thoughts is, well, if you actually have some type of directive to say, okay, at this point, I want to, you know, only have maybe 20% of the threads being able to be spawned during this, this one section, that might be better. You could leave that in the comments, but doesn't that just sound like Pragma OMP, right? So I think that, that, that then, you know, chooses the question of, well, what is Pythonic at that, Pythonic-ish at that point, right? If we're leaving things that literally look like C, is that really that useful? Um, are we complicating the language? Is maybe that the way that we're gonna achieve um, composable parallelism when we start combining them? Uh, I think that that you know, poses a great question. Uh, augmenting the uh, threading behavior seems to be the more useful um, based upon the experiments that we've run and you know, putting the bulk of the responsibility, but that also means that putting the bulk of the responsibility is on the users themselves, right? So if, depending on how you want to do, if you're a framework designer, how do you choose to do, how you choose to do your threading is really your choice, you know, that, and I think that that is a relatively heavy responsibility, not as heavy as expecting yours to always be, you know, caught midway, you know, being completely thread safe, but it's also a high requirement. Um, and you know, threading in general for numerical has a lot of known frameworks. And I think the thing is, is if you're gonna try to take away, try to uh, like remove the gill or do anything similar, you're gonna be removing the, uh, uh, the ability to use just a, um, a, a Python object and then you'll need stricter typing, right? So you know, then that poses the question, well, why are you actually using Python in this instance? Um, so, you know, to kind of summarize everything and kind of end it, the Python ecosystem has a critical mass of you know, good frameworks that you know, we've kind of walked through today that look to address multi-threading and multi-processing. So for those of you who are working on it, you know, keep on pushing and seeing what the limits are. Um, today's uh, demonstration here, we're, we're showing what we're trying to do on our space and you know, we encourage you to either contribute or, or find other ways and propose other ways of doing so. Um, so thank you and with that, I'm open for Q&A. Uh, thanks very much. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Hey, uh, great talk, thanks. Um, you were ask, asking about a, a good interface for, uh, you know, for integrating this into, into you know, uh, systems that require parallelism into Python. Um, you're probably aware of Joblib. Yes. Uh, so how does, how does that interact? Is, that, is your stuff running below Joblib, or do you directly integrate with it somehow? So that's a great question. Um, so if we step back a little bit and we look at where Joblib sits within you know, this, this part, right? So when you have Joblib and then you, you're calling things from Joblib, you can, you can, you know, those are two different layers of parallelism. And that's where I was talking about where, because there's actually no real you know, communication between the job, what the joblib requirements are, and then your, the numpy call that you put into joblib, that's where that over description area can occur. And so um, I, I think that joblib does a very good, good, uh, uh, well, good job, no pun intended here, of being able to separate those, those tasks out and being e easily able to define a way to compose the jobs that you need to do in either uh, you know a task parallel format, you know its its biggest, I think, comparison would be would be Dask, and you know both of them do a very good job in that space. But um, I think we still run into the problem of we have a composable uh, parallelism problem. You know we have something that's clearly uh, a uh, application level parallelism and something that's clearly data or or um, task parallelism and that 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 link either you know from from the way that we've defined python it either needs to be kept separate or we need a way of interlinking it without breaking uh you know 
the I guess the APIs that they were defined as. I think I think we're we're losing the abstraction capability if we try to bring that layer down too much. Thanks. Thanks. Anyone else? Yep. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned about uh, CPU bound uh, parallelism that it's very clear when you can uh, know about uh, the over subscription. But also, there's a part of a single weight, a single weight uh, pattern um, that's basically for I/O bound processes. Right. So, at the end, it's very hard to determine what's a better weight approach with that because uh, it's uh, you don't know if the CPU is starving while you are doing all the I/O weight processes or how how you would approach that. Uh, so, I mean, we one of the things that I do as a consultant is I work with customers that have those style of problems and to determine whether we have a CPU bound slash IO bound problem and determine what's actually the issue, we typically use a Python profiler. So um, one of the, the products that we use is Intel uh, VTune amplifier. And so we will take a look and see what's going, what's going on from a code profiling perspective um, and then try to look at you know what's the behavior of the code in that in that space. Sometimes it takes a, it takes a little bit of static analysis to be able to determine that, or looking at I/O saturation with the tools um, to be able to determine that. But it's actually a very very hard thing to detect, and you're right, it is extremely hard to know. If given no tools, even with our open source profile, like the open source profilers in the Python space, yeah, it's actually very very hard to know what's going on. Okay, thank you. Hello, good talk, thanks. Um, Two small questions. Is SMP developed by Intel as well? Yes. Okay. And which one was the first one to be developed? Uh, TBB was the first to be developed. Um, the, the threading building blocks has been around for quite a, quite some time. I think it became open source recently. Yeah. Um, but it, it's the the longer legacy one. Um, and then SMP was developed, I think, about a year ago um, to kind of address the space because we, you know, one of the 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 systems that we used had um, 63 plus cores per uh, uh, per socket, and then you get that towards a lot of them. We we started seeing that this problem existed in in you know when, when you start scaling out that that issue. So we that's where we kind of why we developed it a little later in the in the game. Okay, and, and what is um, TBB for Pi doing in in C? Um, it's operating with the uh, TBB runtime, actually. So one of the things that we do is it's one of the libraries that we, we ship. And so it's actually operating directly with that, li that dynamic library. So um, that runtime, basically, when you, if, you if you download any of our packages like NumPy or Scikit-Learn that utilize it, it'll download the runtime and interact at runtime with that library. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, anybody else with a question? Hi there, a great talk. Um, I'd like to ask just um, what if I would like to run a few programs under the TPB or SMP? Uh, what would happen? Will they uh, understand that uh, like their over some subscription could happen and like would happen, or or should I like um, concentrate everything in one program to avoid problem? That is a great question. Um, so the way that both of these packages work and how most types of uh, tools that, uh, that accomplish in this, that accomplish that type of control in that space have to have is you have to start from a single Python process in order for that to work. So if you think about how Joblib and Dask are doing it, it's starting from something that's multi-processing down to something that's, that's threading based upon those processes, but it started from the same one. If you start them on different Python processes, and they're not started from the same one, then that's problematic because they don't see each other. So they're going to have different pools. Whereas if you op if you start it from the same one, it's going to have the same pool, and so it'll be better. It'll be able to better handle oversubscription in that manner. So it's better to focus that and start it from a single Python process, if possible. I don't know if I got uh, the difference between the TBB and, and SMP. Mm -hmm. What are the use cases, one over the other? So one of the, the things is, is um, with TBB, it is a dynamic um, 
it, it handles dynamic types of threading better. So say you have something that returns within 10 seconds, but it has the chance of returning in a second, right? If you have that in it with TVB, it'll be able to say, okay, this one ended quickly. We're gonna put this one back in the pool and, re and come, let it come back out. SMP handles it a different way, which is to say, I'm gonna pass down the, uh, the settings for um, the amount of uh, threads that can be spawned from that process. So it's gonna say, so say I have like, you know, OMP num threads equal to z like one or two, and it's gonna say, okay, for this process, it's gonna be two, for this one, it's gonna be one. So it's passing it down by saying, I can, I, I'm having these, these settings passed down, and that's how it controls it, by not letting it go outside of it. But it's better for structured work, because if you think about it, if, if it's structured and it passes down those settings, then they'll stay essentially semi-pinned to the processors and not be you know, jumping to different processors all the time, and then you'll have, like, you'll have cache issues if you start doing that. So symmetric work generally is better for SMP, um, and then more dynamic types of parallelism that have the chance of returning a little bit earlier or unbalanced is better for TPB. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, any more? Can we use these uh, packages without the uh, Intel version of NumPy, SKLearn, and so on? I mean, you can download the packages themselves. So you can download TBB for Pi as a standalone and just run it with your, again, this is the kind of the talk about Pythonic-ish, right? So you can download both of these packages independently of our distribution on Conda, um, on our Conda channel, which is, um, you can just use the uh, dash C Intel channel if you're using Conda to actually look look up these packages. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, one more at the front. Hi. Uh, can you say something about platform compatibility? I guess it runs on Linux, but what about BSD, Windows, Open Solaris, and so on? Great question. Um, TBB runs on all platforms right now, so we have it for, um, for Mac, Windows, Linux, and majority of flavors of Linux as well. SMP right now is Linux only because of its um, uh, of some of the items that we're using, but we're looking to see what other options we have in that space. But it's just currently only on Linux for the time being. Any other questions? Is that one back? No. No? All right. Well, we'll thank our speaker, David, again. Thanks. Thanks.